To me, anarchy is a way of life. I think that anarchy is not a noun, but an adjective which describes the tension that has always existed between moral autonomy and political authority, especially in the area of combinations, whether they're to be voluntary or coercive. The way I tell my friends, say, what can you expect from me? You can expect me to be trustworthy, not to take you for a ride, not to endlessly seek advantages, to do my share of the work of the world, to put back as much as I can, to take out only what I need, and to try not to hurt you or hurt anybody else. If I can expect that from you, from all of you, then between us as self-governing people who don't need a cop to tell us what to do, we can start building voluntary combinations and get the work of the world done without the boss and without the state. That's it. My acquaintance with anarchists has been very forceful in shaping my own way of life because I learned very early that you don't have to wait for the revolution to be an anarchist that anarchy is something you can live. I decided not to be competitive, but to favor the cooperative side of my personality. Because anarchy is a word used to instill fear and terror in people, it was a relief to hear people introduce themselves as communal, individual, communist anarchists to describe themselves. They didn't follow any hierarchical organization. They wanted their right to express themselves as individuals, a right to consensus in decision making and decisions for which they would be individually responsible. I grew up in a socialist family rather than an anarchist family. We're all, my parents were all Finnish immigrants, socialist party, they were in the labor movement a long time. But my father was something of a rebel. He never took to any kind of bureaucracy. And he was an active union member, farmer, cooperator. I had a cousin who was radical, an active uh, activist in the working class movement. She organized unions, strikers, she for abortion rights back in the 20s and 30s. And she also was a heroine of mine. And she reminds me very much of how I conceive Emma has, as having been. World War II saw me as an anarchist pacifist meeting with other anarchists who are anti-war. We had discussion group going, we published a newspaper, and we're turned on to what anarchism might mean. We were opened up to another whole world, the world of A.S. Neal and his new educational ideas, Paul Goodman and his anarchist millenarian ideas, Wilhelm Reich in his anti-nuclear family ideas, and they were all very important in our viewing ourselves as anarchists. When World War II ended, my spouse and I, who were living together, had not gotten married. Despite my mother and father's opinion, I said, Mom, you were never married. Why do you think I should be married? She said, things were different that time, she says. Free love was very popular when Emma Goldman was around. It is not popular, so popular anymore. And I said, I'll always remember what you told me when I was a little kid. And I asked you, why didn't you wear a wedding ring? And you said, Papa and I love each other, and we don't have to have a license like dogs do to be together. And that made a really profound impression on me. When I was 12, we had to write a paper. First paper I ever wrote. I wrote it on cooperatives. Now. I don't know why I thought of cooperatives, but I did. I was, I was a person who, even then, who believed in cooperation. I didn't believe in competition. This meant that somehow I understood that competition wasn't great. And through my life, I had problems in school because I just didn't like to compete. Now, I didn't realize I was an anarchist. I didn't know what anarchism was, even though I lived in Brooklyn and which was a hotbed of anarchism. I had no idea. When I came to California, I met several people who called themselves anarchists, and when we talked about it, it, they were exactly, they felt just as I did. It was a new experience because, well, I guess feminism helped me experience my being as a woman. Anarchism helped me experience my being as a human being. 
and that's why I'm very happy I found anarchism. Let's talk about violence and anarchy. The appellation violent has been applied to anarchists ever since the Haymarket. When somebody threw a bomb, some people were killed, four anarchists were executed, and we were everlastingly labeled by the press as being bomb throwers. We've always had to deal with that label. And that's all it is. It's the, the pot calling the kettle black. Exactly that. Nothing more, nothing less. Who has all the guns? You know, who has the hydrogen bomb? When a shop closes in Dayton, Ohio, and the plant runs away, when a steel mill closes in, in Detroit, it's taken, used three generations of workers. It's incredibly violent, the impact on people's lives. When anarchism is characterized as violent and chaotic, what in fact is being described is this rotten capitalist system which runs you from pillar to post. You never know where it's going to jump or what it's going to do. It creates wars, pestilence, depressions, agony in people's lives, the agony in the earth itself. My spouse and I were tired of living in the shuffle of New York City. We were in correspondence with people who had been conscientious objectors in the West Coast. Uh, they were anarchists. San Francisco was uh, the hotbed of culture and anarchy or something like that. Sex and anarchy is an article in Harper's had put it. And we decided to see what the West Coast had. And we came out here and loved, 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 loved the environment and decided this was a place for community. We lived in a community house in the city. Uh, it was a, open, an open place, predating the kind of flower children era later on. This was 1948. We met up with people who were involved in, in the beginnings of KPFA. Denny Wiltshire, who was doing the public forum uh, programming, was very much interested in, in our ideas of anarchism and education. Little kids, that's where it starts. Now you take your kids, and when they're five, six years old, on a given day in September, you abandon them to authorities and institutions over which they have no control. That's dumb. I recently came back from a very rewarding experience. I was a volunteer worker in a refugee camp in Harlingen, Texas. The idea in the camp was to motivate the people to control their own lives. Uh, it was a great pleasure to learn that the director of the camp and the person who owned the property were anarchists. And the camp was run on anarchist principles, which simply meant that instead of a director doing the planning and assigning the jobs, the refugees did the planning, and the refugees determined who would do the work, who would do the cooking, who would do the cleanup, and how the camp would be run. People started to embroider, to make hammocks, to do artwork, to use their time in a profitable way. It not only involved doing the shit work, but also being sure that all the people were living up to their responsibilities. It became an exercise in cooperation. It became anarchy at work. And it also empowered the people to determine how they would run their lives. And it gave them a very remarkable introduction to life in the United States. We who thought we knew what anarchy was about had to step aside and let the refugees experience taking control of their own lives and then being responsible for them so they could come back and evaluate them. It also gave us an opportunity to work as staff, to work with the refugees, to show them how anarchy could operate. So a good part of my life I would consider myself a libertarian socialist, really a closet anarchist, and finally I, I declared myself an anarchist without qualification. I also became a wobbly quite a few years ago in the IWW, and that represented an anarcho-syndicalist tradition to me. I felt that I had to ha have some left organization where I could hang my hat with it, and the one that I felt comfortable with most was the wobbly. They're anti-authoritarian, anti-bureaucratic, very democratic in their approach. As I grew older, I had naturally to work in hierarchical situations and they weren't very promising or very pleasing. Luckily, after I divorced, my children were grown up, I found Modern Times Bookstore and here I am in a non-hierarchical setting and it's been wonderful.
Modern Times is not a, an anarchist bookstore, but it is a collective bookstore. And it follows collective principles. Each of the people gets the same, same amount of money per day, and uh, we all make decisions consensually. Basically, that, those are anarchist principles. All the people have equal power, and the power is, resides in the collective, not in any one person, so there's no boss. That's what makes it so nice to work here. If we want to make a little more money, we talk about it, and we figure out if we can afford it, and we add some money to our salaries. If we want to carry a certain book, we talk about it. So it's a very different situation from all of the work situations I've ever had. It most closely resembles an anarchist situation than any I've ever been in, anyway. It gives me a sense that what I feel is important, what I want is important. It's not that I have to please the boss. I have to please myself and my fellow workers. But I want to do that anyway. It just resembles what I conceive of as an anarchist situation. What we hope someday will exist all over. David and I remained together and decided to have children too. My experience in the cooperative nursery school movement was really very important for me because in the early 50s, the ideas of preschool child rearing were really libertarian. and There was full acknowledgement of individual growth and development, of a non-authoritarian relationship between teachers and parents and children. But what I wanted to do with the rest of my life was to be involved in some kind of libertarian education. I went back to school to learn the techniques of teaching, was totally discouraged about the institution of public education. State schools, whether they be in the United States, Russia, Japan, China, anywhere, the purpose of education is to indoctrinate its students to be good citizens of their country, to be patriotic, to be a good citizen of the national state, the very antithesis of anarchist ideas. I would not want to teach in the public school system. Most of us, as we are abandoned to authorities and institutions over which we have no control, being sent to state-owned schools, for instance, when we're really little, wind up unable to form voluntary combinations. We wind up part of coercive combinations, hierarchical combinations, whether they're marital, boss-employee, military, what have you. All we ever wanted to do as people was to be able to form voluntary combinations. I was in the printing trades unions, uh, in the National Typographical Union, which recently merged into the Communications Workers Union. I was always considered a rabble-rouser, a militant, uh, a shit-kicker, as some people would call it. In the union, bureaucrats never quite liked me or thought too much of me because I was always in their hair. I mean, any time there was some attempt to squash democracy in the union, to the, even to the elementary point of not allowing things to be posted on a bulletin board of parliamentary maneuvers at union meetings. I was always one of the first to raise my voice in protest. We have free speech in this union, as the labor is all about. The wobbly in me spoke at all these times, too. Let's deal with violence and anarchy in three ways. First, personal violence. Ammon Hennessy, the great Catholic anarchist, was sent as a troubleshooting welfare worker in, in Minneapolis to deal with a guy chiseling mattresses from welfare and selling them to the poor. Ammon's a little guy. He fellow walked all around the table, big guy, with a butcher knife in his hand. Finally stuck it in the table in front of Ammon. The fellow came over to take a swing at him. Ammon reached out and shook his hand for about a minute. The guy looked at him and said, what did you do? Ammon said, look at your big hairy fist. That's your, that's your toughest weapon. My strongest weapon is I got moral courage. And that's your weakest weapon, because you haven't got any. I'm going to use my strongest against your weakest. And I won, didn't I? The man can escalate all the way from a cop on the beat with a handgun up to a hydrogen bomb. And he begs you to walk up that road with him. Sticks his chin out, say, plant one there. You know, make my day. What really frightens him. You want the cops to show up? Put a big banner up that says, peace. They'll show up with face shields and batons, because that's what threatens them. Their game is violence. This state is an incredibly violent thing. We, we live in a climate of violence, capitalism in the state. We're trying to get out of it. We have to get away from that. The violence of property. 
I, as a white man, was born armed to the teeth with an arsenal of privileges. Racial privilege, economic privilege, sexual privilege. That architecture of privilege is grounded in property. Our feelings about the ownership of people and our ownership of things. Unless we can overcome that disease, the ownership, mine and yours, we're going to be violent toward each other. If you must have yours and I must have mine, no matter how cordial our relationship, we're secretly armed against each other. And possession is detention that we must eliminate, get rid of that. A good example, I have a car. If somebody stole my car, by the fact of ownership, I commit myself, to, if somebody steals it, to calling the police to get it back. But in a hot pursuit, whoever stole it could get killed. I commit myself, by the fact of ownership, to all of the state's violence, unless I'm willing just to write it off. The solution to that is to deal with possession, possession of people and things, less and less and less, until we have nothing and gain all. The third kind of violence, and that's the trashing of property. That has a real salutary effect on your psyche. But it was for the Wobblies years ago coined the phrase, the workers' superstitious reverence for property. It's the American Property Party with its Republican and Democratic wings. In a propertarian society, we're raised through those institutions that we're abandoned to with the respect for private property, hmm? irrespective of whose it is. Okay. When we can educate people, as to what is authentically ours and what is, is not ours, what has been stolen from us, we only wind up hurting each other. Violence is, is down for three counts and knocked out. It's only going to make enemies out of people that ought to be our friends. I was able to see community development among refugees from El Salvador who lived in three different camps in Honduras. It was an opportunity to see a form of anarchism, a form of running a person's life that was not hierarchical, but that took into fact that as individuals they would not survive, as a community they could share their skills, teach one another, and hold on to their faith in the future. The children were responsible for part of the work. Their day was devoted to learning a task, to education. Adults also went to school in the workshops where they make everything that they wear. They make their own furniture, and they make their own cooking utensils. They have a machine shop where men as well as women learn how to repair small motors, how to keep the cars that service the camp functioning. All this has evolved through a non-hierarchical program where people take responsibility. The structure is not oppressive. They have this inner peace and inner comfort and inner determination to survive. Had our own children. We were trying to raise them in a, in a non-authoritarian way. We wanted the best for our immediate families. And we started a school called Walden because we realized that the unifying ideas of civil disobedience, the interest in nature, uh, and, and natural sciences versus the highly developed technocratic world we lived in were very important to us. And we just took our kids and we started teaching them, and it was wonderful. We believed in a school that did not proselytize, but would make all points of view available. If you raise people this way, if you give them the tools of thinking independently and of tr attempting to understand what was going on politically, is a way of looking at life. Again, the school was not to make anarchists. In the heyday of, of uh, meaningful schools, meaningful education, uh, Walden was considered by everybody as in the forefront of, of advanced education. And kids came like crazy to see how we were doing this libertarian school. And it, felt, it felt important. The first year was 1958. Founders are all gone. We're, we're not teaching anymore, and we don't have much input in the, in the policies of the school. The school is basically a teacher's cooperative, but it's still a place where decisions are made as by a community of people who agree consensually. My grandchild goes there, as does another grandchild of one of the founding group, and it's an exciting place for children. I was very proud to be very active part of the movement during the Vietnam War when we, uh, in our typographical union, 
and trying to get the unions to take a stand against the Vietnam War. We were threatened by some of the more pro-war members of the union. We did succeed. Finally, we got our union to go on marches against the Vietnam War. We considered one of our great achievements when labor was supposed to be hard hat and George Meany pro-Vietnam. I'm 61 years old now, so I don't think I'll be called upon to be drafted, but if we'd have to stand up against the boss class, the capitalists, or state bureaucrats who want to impose themselves, I'd be proud to be in the ranks. During the 60s, it seemed to me that people were really uh, understanding what anarchism was all about, especially with all those communes. They were really experimenting with anarchistic kind of life collective living and collective work. The people were very young and so they didn't have much patience and they gave up during the 70s. But it was a wonderful experiment because people saw that it might be able to work for people to have collective living situations and collective work situations. The living situation these days is certainly not like it was in the 60s with all those communes. But people have a memory of it, and maybe if things get bad enough, they'll go back to that. My greatest teachers have been the, the senior partners in the firm, the IWW. The long memory is the most radical idea in America. Yeah. You know, that's why they don't teach it. You know, you've got to go to your elders to get it. It's a tribute to Mel Most, WBAI's first station manager in 1960s under the aegis of Pacifica. Mel died in his sleep, which probably pushing 80, I would guess. He was a great guy. He was, in fact, a very direct descendant of, of the famous Johann Most, the associate of Emma Goldman and Alexander Berkman. I knew Mel as an anarchist organizer. He was one of the founding members of the Libertarian Book Club. He was also uh, a lifetime IWW organizer, the Wobblies. And just before he died, he had been getting very active again in organizing. And Mel was always active. He always had something going. But he'd been sick last year, or he wasn't, his health wasn't all that good. And when he came out of the hospital, he was using one of those uh, aluminum walkers. He'd been pretty shaky and, what, and not up to much. But it seemed like he was getting his 30th wind and uh, getting right back in stride as an organizer and doing more than ever. And in the last couple of weeks before he died, he uh, did a number of things. He founded a new group called the Humanarchist Front, a combination of humanism and anarchism. And he also organized an IWW job branch in New York for artists and writers, uh, which was the Living Theater, formerly run by Julian Beck and Judith Malina. Mel had been a friend of Julian's and Judith's for a long, long time. And in this renaissance of activity, this late springtime of, uh, of activity in Mel's life, he, had, he thought of them as the, f the first artists in New York that he wanted to organize into the IWW. Last time I had, uh, saw him was at Esther Dolgoff's funeral, Sam Dolgoff's lifetime companion, who died just a few weeks before Mel. And Mel was the chairman of that event. I mean, that, that shows how busy and active uh, he was. He was also, incidentally, uh, for a number of years involved in uh, uh, prostitutes organizing. He was an expert on the social aspects of prostitution and very much a spokesman for uh, the prostitute union and uh, other similar organizations. Of course, he'd been in San Francisco at the big uh, Continental Anarchist Gathering. He was, uh, he was uh, trying to organize people to do an old-fashioned IWW soapbox event. He was going to put up a box and try to have a 24-hour ranting going on at it. Mel was one of the handful of old people who, who were at that event, and the rest of the 3,500 people who were there were, were quite young. Mel was always uh, very popular with young people and very good at organizing them, and even went to the extent of preferring young people to uh, a lot of the older people. The reasons are obvious. If you get to be 75 <laughs> years old, and your soul is still on fire. Most of the people that you know have burnt out or died. And uh, naturally, you're going to prefer strong, idealistic young people to your own, own contemporaries. And that's really sort of the way Mel was. He always discovered the energy level of the, of the young. And uh, was one of those older generation anarchists who very consciously set out to make himself a link between the past and the future. 
by uh, always uh, speaking with young people and recruiting them. Now, these wobblies, I guess, got a, some street speaking going on on Tuesday. We even got a whole set of guidelines about how to do street speaking. I was kind of keen. Uh, and I want the IWWs and everybody else of that persuasion to get down there and, uh, and try to take your hand at soapboxing. I'll get my chops in now, okay? Listen to those old soap boxers like uh, Phil Melman, you know, that I soap boxed with here in San Francisco 15, 20 years ago. Because those guys talked in shorthand. They didn't waste any breath. I say, fellow workers, we are going to organize as a class. The working classes are going to organize as a class. What is the working class, fellow workers? The working class is anybody who has a boss that works for wages. It doesn't matter if you're a college professor or a ditch digger. If you've got a boss and you're working for wages, you're in the working class, you better be proud of it. Why, the, the middle class is just a joke made up by the bosses to keep us fighting against each other. All right, we're going to organize as a class. We're going to organize into one big union. One big union. We're going to have a general strike. General strike lasts about half an hour. Then we're going to take this sock full of puppy shit they call a culture apart and put it together so it makes more sense. With the means of production in the hands of the producers, production for use instead of profit, create abundance for workers enough and for parasites. Thank you. Oh, I have led a good life full of peace and quiet. I shall have an old age full of rum and riot. I have been a good lad, careful and artistic. I shall have an old age coarse and anarchistic. Once I paid my taxes and followed every rule. Banker, boss, and bureaucrat thought me a willing tool. I voted Democratic and paid the church its due. Now all those swine will have to find some other chump to screw. <laughs> of interest, banks, and credit, insurance, tax, and rent. Of lawyers, agents, generals, and clerics, I repent. With this for corporations and scorn for those elected. Oh, I will be an old bum, loved but unrespected.